let's, let's delve into color pencils. Uh, color pencils are something that I've always enjoyed working with. They're the artist version of a Crayola crayon, basically. I mean, not that you can't do fine art with crayons, because Mr. Crayola can prove me wrong, but this is something we can put on our wood, over our wood burnings, as well as on our carvings. Uh, I'm going to pass around three pencils. They're all blue. There are three different grades. The darkest one is a student grade, which means it has less wax than it has pigment. This is from the Fiber Castell set. This is an artist grade. It's got an even nice amount of pigment to wax in it, but it's not as good as this. This is the Einor's Woodless Color Pencils. These are professional grade color pencils. I'm going to pass these three around. I want you to try them on a piece of paper so you can see how they work, how the difference is. When you're working with color pencils, it's all about the pressure. So if you're going to take the cheap one and you're just going to come on here and do the light color on it, then you can take the medium one, the darker one. It will take a lot longer to build up color with this one. And now we're going to do the professional one here. You can see the difference just on the, all the same pressure, but it's going to be a different quality of the work. I want you guys to try these out so you can see what the different difference is. I started using the colored pencils as separate pieces to add to the gourds as another competition form. Um, I've done five medallions on here, and basically we've put a different flower in each one. Um, they, they're really pale uh, because it's very hard to get the graphite off of these once you start doing the colored pencils. So I do the tracings very lightly so you can't see it very well. So it alleviates a lot of the black line on here. So consequently, it makes it a little harder to see. Um, normally, what I'll do is I will take yellow, and I will go over any area that's going to be green, just lightly. You want to use pressure between 1 and 10. We want to use about a 1 being our lightest, just to barely get a base coat on it, just to separate it out. On the flower parts, I did those in white. So I can separate out, and when I visually look at it, I can tell what parts are going to be flower and what parts are going to be the stems. Then we're going to start with our lightest colors and work into the darks. We're going to take the light green, and we're going to work that along the edge, because this is where our sunlight's going to be coming in from. And if you always flip your pencil, just roll it a little bit in your fingers every time, it keeps the point longer on your colored pencil. There's a tooth to a gourd, just like there's grain in the wood. On paper, there's a tooth to it, so if it's very smooth, so if it's very coarse. If you sand down the gourds, you're going to lock off some of the tooth. You won't waste as much colored pencil. If you're going to put it on wood, sand it really super fine so that there's not a lot of tooth, so you can have a lot more work on your colored pencils. You'll get, be able to apply the color easier. Again, we're not using a lot of pressure. But as we gradually build up the wax, we're going to build up a little bit more color as we're going. And you'll start to see the leaves starting to come out. I usually work in tiny little circles. The technique is called scrumbling, which I didn't know until I was in art school. But I've been doing it since I was a kid. I didn't like coloring back and forth. I liked the pattern that it laid out as you did the little circles. But what it does is it allows you to work evenly and fill in the areas and keep the pressure. You start to see those a little better now. They're starting to come in. Just what's ever comfortable in your hand. As long as every time you stop, you just twist, twist the pencil a little bit. The point is the one thing that's going to get down into the valleys and up over the tooth, the valleys, the hills and valleys in the project. So if we always keep a pencil sharpener handy, and we keep our pencils sharpened, we should have no problem laying color on. If you use a lot of pressure right away, you're going to end up with really dark lines. But then you will be able to blend any more color in. Like so, now we're just adding a little bit of dark shadow line on there. Then we come, come back in here with the yellow. 
put a little bit of sparkle back in. Now we're using the, a, large, a heavier pressure on here so we can really put the wax down. You will get little crumbs. The last thing you want to do is brush it. It'll catch on your hand and it will also smear. So a blush brush, a makeup brush, or just blow, it, blow the crumbs off, but a clean brush, a soft bristle brush, if it's going to be, if you're going to use a paint brush, then I would recommend a red sable because the hair is very fine and very soft on the brush, and you can just sweep the excess crumbs off. All right, then we're going to go in and we'll do the next colors we're going to put in with pink on here. Again, we're going to go in very lightly, just laying down a very thin base coat of color. I'm just picking a few of these petals to do. This apparently lays right on the surface. Correct. So you're 10, 15 years down the road. Is this as stable as paint? It's as stable as paint. Um, it can be if it's sealed properly. Once you have a piece that you're done working with, you, or you're going to stop for the day, or you've built up enough of the wax and you can't get any more color on it, we always seal anything that's movable with workable fixative. This is Dick Blick's brand. Golden makes it, Krylon makes it. Half a dozen companies make workable fixative. They make fixative that's not workable. It's a sealer. It must say workable on it in order to be able to put color pencil on top of it and have it stick. The one medallion here I have done and it is sprayed. That's this one here. But the background hasn't been removed on it yet. The coloring's all done, the shadowing's done on it, but when I take, I didn't like the look of it, it just wasn't, it didn't stand out enough for me. So when I finish the nest of them, we're going to take it off like this. Now see how it pops out of that background? Just by taking that dark shell off of there and making that white background, it pops that flower right out of there. So I'm not worrying about whether or not this is going to look right when it's done. As long as I can take a little bit of that background off, it'll pop it right out of there. Now these have all been sprayed with the workable fixative. And I spray each one separately when I'm done with them. Um, when I'm done with the whole piece, you, can, you want to put spray acrylic on first, and you want to put on four or five coats of the spray acrylic on it and let it dry thoroughly between each coat because it's microscopic little dots of acrylic varnish and there's going to be spaces in between it. It doesn't, you don't want to overspray, so there's always going to be little dots in between. So putting on three or four coats of it will ensure a better coverage because if you put an oil finish on here, even with this on, the oil varnish will dissolve the wax in the crayons and it will ruin it. It'll just wipe it right off. So the only time you can put a wax finish on here or a oil based finish on the wax is if it's sealed in acrylic first. Some people just have to have that harder than hard finish on there and want the oil based finish on it. Why? Acrylics work just as well. It's a piece of art, you know, where it's not like it's sealed on the inside to eat out of. So I've used just the acrylics on this. Same thing goes with pen and ink. Pen and ink should be sealed because if you don't, it'll run or it'll bleed when you spray it. So it's a preventative measure to make sure that when you get, when you're working on your pieces, when you're, if you're particularly on pen and ink, if you're done for the day, give, quick, give it a quick spray. You can always go back in the next day and continue working, but it's not going to, nothing's going to move then. Everything's going to stay where it is. So these guys have all been sprayed. We're going to go back to this guy. And we've got some base coat in here on the color on these leaves, on these outside leaves now. And again, we always start with very light pressure when you're working with the color pencils, particularly with the woodless ones. They put down so much pigment so fast that if you put it down so heavy, you're not going to be able to get them to blend. And I'm going to, actually, I'm going to do this one right here. We're going to put this one down a little heavier so you can see what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, we've got quite a bit of color on that one petal. So we're going to work in and work some other colors into this to show you. But when we do the other two, 
it'll blend much easier and the colors will be more outstanding. When it's working, when you have your color pencils working correctly and you have built up your layers in the order that you're using them in, you're going to end up with almost an airbrushed look to the piece because there won't be any of this little shelf showing through. It will actually fill up and just layer after layer, little thin layers of wax will build up until the entire piece is covered with a, a multiple layers of wax. And eventually it will fill the whole thing in. Now if you're having problems with the getting it to blend, there also is a blending stick. It's actually clear. Um, it works great, but it does dull the color just a little bit when you're blending with it. So if we're going to come in here and work on this, you can see it just took down just a little bit of that. And basically all it is is just clear wax. Once this is in here, then we want to start thinking about where these leaves are going behind the main bulb of the flower, so we want to start adding in our shadows. This book on colored pencils is probably one of the better ones that I've read. Um, they do a lot of breakdown about how different colors will blend together when you're working on a piece, how you can achieve whites in dark areas. And he also goes through and tells you the individual colors he uses to achieve the looks he's doing. I think the hardest thing when you're doing with color pencils or even when you're wood burning is leaving areas white. So there's a, lot, a really good technique in here about leaving areas that don't have anything on them. I do it in my wood burning by drawing the areas with a pencil. And once I put those in a pencil, I make sure that it's a blue or a green color pencil when I'm drawing those in there. And then when I'm doing my wood burning, I don't touch those areas. So then when I take my wash and I clean that off and I clean all that color pencil off, all those areas are still left white from underneath. But he gives you really good examples about coloring, shadowing, and how to blend. And some of the things that he puts in that you would not think about using, rather than jumping straight into black to create shadows, in the reds we use more purples and blues to bring out the darker colors in it once we're blending them all in. I think it adds a greater depth to it rather than just using the straight black every time. I always, I always start light and work dark. The darker colors are more intense, so they will layer on heavier and put more pigment down than the, than the lighter colors. I have the biggest trouble with yellows. Um, I find that they, because they are so translucent, that they don't um, layer well unless they're on a white paper. That's when I see the biggest change in them, is when I put them on a white paper. A lot of folks who do pen color pencils on gourds will go ahead and gesso the entire area that they're going to work. Uh, they'll even put several coats of it on, sanding it between it so that the gesso is itself is actually smooth before they start. And that gives them the white base to work off of. They also find it uh, easier to work the color pencils on the gesso because it's such a, that flat white gives you a an even tooth to work on and it holds the pencil well. So that might be an option if you're working it on wood and you're having problems laying the color down is put a uh, thin coat of gesso on and keep it uh, so that it, uh, that paints on there and it gives you that white background to work from so that you have the highest contrast then. I like color pencils because they're unlike doing markers, they don't dry out. They're here forever. These, until you wear it, use them up, they're going to be good. You can have a set for 30, 40 years and they'll still be around as long as you haven't sharpened them all down to nothing, you'll be, still be coloring them, which you can't say about markers. The professional grade color pencils, the woodless one, they come in 12s or 24 only. They don't come in the big sets like this. Um, you can buy these um, for about, I think, between 25 and $30 at Michael's. Um, the problem with buying them from Michael's is that you can't inspect the package to see if they look like this and all broken up. Um, if these are dropped, they will shatter because they have no wood on them. But they'll outlast these by 10 times because they're solid color. 
So they require less sharpening because there's more color to it and it, it, the whole pencil just sharpens right down. Um, I have taught color pencil class and I've ran into people who are color pencil artists and if they don't have never used these, I'll just walk over and hand them a set, brand new. I said, try these. If you like them, you bring me 20 bucks. I'm in booth 10. They usually bring me 20 bucks. I've only had one set come back and she's going, I like them, but I'm going to wait till I get home. And then she called me up and ordered them anyway because it was cheaper to buy them through me. Well, you buy them in bulk, and then you don't you get less you don't have to pay as much for them. So, I try to pass the savings on to people. So now I'm going to go back into this run over here. We're going to put a little more yellow in here just to see if we can highlight this one side a little bit. So we're using the yellow as the blend this time. Watercolor pencils are a pigment, and they actually have to have water to dissolve them in or get them a little wet in order for them, they'll, they'll draw, but it's, it's like tempera paint that's been dried and, and formed, where this is a wax base. These won't dissolve in water. Now I could pour water on here and nobody, nothing would happen except to put water beads up and falls off. So it's, like, it's more like wax on the car. That's why the oil, when you use an oil on here, it will dissolve it and take it off and just ruin it. Nothing worse than spending all that time working on something and have it gone to gone down the drain. They're actually pretty, pretty easy. You can, if you get a, too much buildup, you can take a razor blade and just scrape off, use it on the edge and just scrape off the wax. You can take um, a fine piece of sandpaper, sand it off. It's not going to do any harm to the gourd because the shell's harder than the wax and you can just sand it right off and it'll come right off. You can. Um, I would use an ink eraser. I find that if you're using a pencil eraser, it's going to gum up the end of the eraser, and then you're going to need to take clean the end of the eraser off because it's going to stick to the, that color will be on there. So if you hit it on a piece of paper, it's going to come off. Um, if you notice, I have a, the black and white here is what I use to transfer, but then I downloaded this one because that's the colors I wanted to use. So I'm on Google image search, girl. If I can find a flower or a color pattern in a a particular flower I like, like the columbine, will go in. I know that they, there are certain colors that they don't come in, so we're going to try and stick with the colors that they do come in. If you want to go wild and make green flowers and pink stems or red stems, make it abstracts out of them, that's fine. Surrealistics are fine. It just keep it in the same theme and be consistent with it through the whole project. I particularly like doing the color pencils if you're doing um, human face because you can put the color on so softly that it could almost be applied like a good foundation in makeup. That it's very light and um, almost paint airbrushed on and very lightly done. So it's not globbed on. Like my dad used to paint cheeks, it was just big red dots on the cheeks. I'm like, Dad, that's just doesn't look good. But that's his idea of painting. He liked to carve, he didn't like to paint. So. We had to do the painting for him, which is my, end up being mom's job after I left. You ever done anything into some wood? Yes. Yeah, I, I put a sanding sealer on and then I sand it down to a, a 500 grit, really smooth. So it's, this, is, this one's been sanded to 400 because I wanted to make sure that the tooth was off of it because gores are pretty tough when they're not um, toothy, when they're not sanded well. Besides, it makes a nice, it feels good in the hand, and they sell better if they're sanded well. Besides, it takes less cut coloring to do. All right, now I want to put a little more shadow on this one. So we're going to come in here, and I'm going to do purple on here. When you get these woodless ones, they're already sharpened on the correct end. Some of the times you buy sets, and they aren't sharpened them on either end. So you have to make sure that you sharpen them on the end that doesn't have the name on it. Can you comment on sharpening it by hand rather than by using a pencil sharpener? Um, why? I mean, this is, this is, this is Prismacolor pencil, pencil sharpener. Everything's right here. Three turns and it's done. Three turns. I have an electric sharpener that I use when I'm working on, on a big piece. Because then I can just go 
and hit it and go, hit it and go. I don't have to worry about this at all. I, I don't do them by hand. It, it's, it's too time consuming. Time is money. That's all adds into the time it takes me to finish a piece. And if I had just, this is my normal pencil sharpener. This one has the blade on the inside. It collects all the shavings in here. There's also a little screw on here where you're buying a pencil sharpener. Check and make sure that there's a screw on the blade because you can buy replacement blades for your, for your pencil sharpeners and you should replace them about once a year just to make sure that they're nice and sharp so that they're not going to be digging in or gouging or breaking your lead off when you're sharpening. Little Phillips head screwdriver, once a year, take it out, replace it. You can buy them in like a little 10 pack at any of the drafting supply stores. I think you might be able to get them at Michael's. But I know that Dick Blick carries them online that you can buy the, the replaceable pencil, uh, the sharpener blades. So I've replaced them on, I've got two at home that have double holes. One is a larger one for more like a fatter crayon. And then one is a standard hole. So it just depends on what size crayon you're working with to sharpen. Now this one on the bottom down here is not going to take as, as the color as well because it's already saturated with the wax. So we're not going to be able to get in quite as many highlights on it as we'd like as we did on the one up here. So you can see there's very little difference on those ones down here, but we have a lot of shading difference up here on this one on the top. And that's just because we're using a lighter pressure, building it up slower. If, you ha if you're having problems, particularly when I do the yellow pieces, I wear a magnifier so I can see how much color is going down. Even on these, they already have the white and yellow on. You can hardly see it. But that's exactly what I wanted when I started out, because if you put too much color down, you saturate it and you can't get a bl good blend on the pieces. So basically, that's what we're going to do on all of this. We're just going to make each one of these is a little different. We're going to use different colors on them. Um, and then we can put the petals back in. Put this back in here. I don't like the blending sticks as well on everything. They work fine on for some things, but there's some things I like the nice sharp division of darks to lights on a piece. And when I'm normally working on a piece uh, for color pencil work, I have just gobs of pencils laying out here. I don't want to have to search. I know what, what colors I'm using on the piece. If I have to go grab something else, it's right here. And I intermix them. They don't seem to care. I don't use the student grade. I, I've tried. It just doesn't work well for me. Now I'm just putting in a few little detail lines on these to get the texture of the petal. And you can't see it now, but once it's sprayed, it'll pop that, those little blue veins right out of the and purple veins out of the top of those leaves. Just like in any of the flowers, you'll see if you look really close at them, you'll see little lines and veins inside of each one of the petals. And that's what we're trying to achieve is that multi-layered look to it so it looks three-dimensional. Yeah, they don't take long to do. As long as you remember not to use, start at five on the pressure, just start at the light pressure and work your way up to it. That's the trick to using color pencils, it's all about the pressure. In any of the pictures that you find that you're going to use, see if you can get a color image as well. Some of the things that I use, like from Dover, these are, this is a Dover pattern here, this one, and it doesn't have any color. So I just go, the, it's spring, we're getting flower catalogs and seed catalogs in the mail. Save them, cut pictures out of them, out of the flowers that you like. Um, the Thompson's Rose Catalog, best color pictures in the world for roses. They're just gorgeous. Whoever does their photography is a genius because they're just stunning pictures. And they're wonderful for color pencil work. So if you're going to carve a rose, you might as well make it look good when you're done. And they've got some of the most outstanding color combinations in there. And that's the best way to see it 
is from a really good photograph. Unless you've got one out in the garden, you just go, bring it on in the house. Because I've taken, these are ones I've taken from my house and my garden for my daylilies. Because I like doing these. These are fun flowers to do. They're easy. Um, the more complicated it is, the more petals it's got. So your roses are going to be your harder ones to do. Well worth doing and taking the time to do them. But when you do them, transfer as much of the image as you need to show the entire outline of the petals and everything that you want, all the details to transfer. But I would use the Sarin transfer paper, the graphite paper, because it's gray rather than using like the um, Mona Lisa, which I normally use because it's black. And it will lay down real heavy pencil lines and you can't erase them off as easily. And you could even wash them off to try and dilute them a little bit. So I would stick with a sarin or a gray paper. You can even use a white transfer paper. They do make a white on if you're using on there. So that it's just so that it's the light enough that you can see the pattern, but it's not going to interfere with the color pencil work. But the black, the real heavy black is hard to do. So we always try to stick with the lighter crayon, with the lighter transfer paper when you're doing all these. And always stick the tape on first, the top one. This is your hinge piece. So when you put this on, you slide the graphite paper up underneath it. You can tape the whole thing down after that. Tra take you through your transfer, take all the tape off except this one. This hinge is the first one on, last one off. Because once you get all the rest of the tape off and you've released it, you take the graphite paper out, you can flip this up and see if the whole image is transferred. And say, oh, I forgot the stems and the leaves off to the side. Then you can just drop this back down with the graphite paper underneath, put them back on. It didn't move. But if you take this off, you're never going to get it to match back up. I don't care how long you try. You might as well sand it off, start over again, because it just, it's not going to work. So that's why the hinge is always the, is always the key piece to put on if you're going to transfer a pattern. And if you're dealing with a round, with a, a flat piece of paper on a really curved surface like gourds, you can come in and do dressmaker's clips. There are little angle cuts that don't touch the pattern, but come in at open spaces so you can fold this around a curved surface and you don't distort the pattern. It's the first time I did a, a giraffe on a piece, his legs were like this long and the body was like this big because it had distorted coming around the curve of the gourd. So after I learned that, I just erased the legs and drew them on by hand. <laughs> but it's, that's something I can do. A lot of people can't. But it's easier sometimes if you remember that you can make clips around here. That's called a dressmaker's clip to ease that pattern around a surface. So if you're dealing on, a, on something that you've carved that isn't flat, try that sometime. Might have a little better, better luck getting the pattern to work out. Have any other questions? If you want to come and look at this, you can see the detail a little closer on the